then we're finishing this section by looking at Ephesians 4, 11 through 16. Verse 11 says, and he, Christ that is, he gave the apostles and the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, and the teachers uh, to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ so that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness, by deceitful schemes. Rather, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ, from whom the whole body, joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped, when each part is working properly, uh, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. All right, would you pray with me? Our gracious Heavenly Father, um, we just thank you for giving us this word, and I just pray that each and every one of us can uh, just learn from it, Lord. I pray that you would speak to us through your word and uh, just move us into obedience and uh, this, would you please stir in our hearts an excitement for Jesus? And Lord, I just pray that you would give me the words to say and um, just give me clarity of thoughts, please, and help me to not go all over the place uh, in this text and just leave everybody confused. Um, so I just pray your grace upon all of us. And uh, we love you and we thank you. And it's in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. I was uh, thinking about this this week. I found it kind of funny. Once upon a time, this is a, a true story, uh, Maddie and I got all dressed up. I put on the very best jeans I had. Of course, I do that every time I have a chance anyway. And, uh, you know, got showered up. She spent like five minutes doing her makeup. I spent like 15 minutes doing my hair. Um, <laughs> Yeah, we got ready for this special occasion, and we left the house, and we drove to this building where we met a couple friends, and we sat in these comfortable seats, and we sat there for probably an hour and a half to two hours with our friends and with quite a few other people, and we watched the stage uh, the entire time, and we were moved in emotion, and we were inspired, and sometimes we laughed, and sometimes it just felt like we were stirred up inside. Uh, we were moved by the soundtracks, there was inspirational speeches. It was, it was quite something. Here's my question. Where do you think Maddie and I were at? Do you think we were at either A, the Carney Cinema 8, B, the Buffalo County Fairgrounds at a concert, or C, at a Sunday morning church service. I love the dead looks. It kind of illustrates my concern is that so many churches in America really seem to be like religious entertainment centers. The fact that you didn't even know where we were at is somewhat I mean, laughable, but also kind of uh, disturbing. And yet, as I explain this scenario, it is probably, in the minds of some, what would be considered a successful or a healthy church, right? What is a healthy church? What is a successful church? Is it one that has a really good stage presence? Is it one that has an incredibly good and gifted worship team with people like me on it? Joking, that would not be a good worship team. 
But what is a healthy church? Most Americans seem to have conflated the idea of a healthy church with the success of Hollywood. But I would ask the question, is that biblically a healthy church? I'm not knocking it, but I'm just asking the question, biblically, is that a healthy uh, church? I bring this up because I feel like this is a very relevant question. If I were to summarize Ephesians 4, 11 through 16, in just really one brief statement, I would say that this passage explains what it means to be a healthy church. How do we go about being a healthy church? And what are characteristics of a healthy church? But I feel like this is an incredibly relevant question because it seems like everybody wants this for LFF, which I love it that we have this attitude, that everybody seems to want the church to be healthier. We want it to be successful. But then I bring up the question, what exactly does that mean? What are you getting at when you say you want LFF to be more successful? Does that mean we get more church members or more regular attenders? Does it mean we add more programs? Or what? Do we have a more varied and dispersed demographic? What does it mean to be a successful church? And how do you measure that? Again, I think it's a very important question for us to consider and to at least wrestle with this passage and see what does Paul say in Ephesians about a healthy church? How does it become healthier? It's really the only thing I want to discuss today is what does this passage say about becoming a healthier church and what does that look like? Before we get there, I thought it would be helpful to first define, well, what is a church biblically? What is a church biblically? But before we can even go there, I think we have to just briefly recap what is the gospel? What have we learned so far about the gospel message in the first three chapters, and I just kind of wanted to uh, review that uh, with you just really quick. So far in our study of Ephesians, uh, we have learned that everybody, apart from Jesus Christ, is dead in their sin. That's Ephesians 2, 1 and 2. We are dead in our sin because of our sin, and in our sin we're completely dead. We are separated from Christ we're separated from all of God's promises, according to Ephesians 2, 11 through 14. We have no hope in the world. That's really the bad news of the gospel message. But the good news of the gospel message is that Jesus Christ died for our sins, that he was buried, and that he was raised to life on the third day. And now, in and through Jesus, we have every blessing everything good that God could give us, just to show you what Paul has mentioned so far in Ephesians alone. Uh, Starting in Ephesians 1, you don't have to turn there, but I'm just reviewing this. We see that in and through Jesus Christ, every heavenly blessing has been extended to us. We see that in and through Jesus Christ, according to Ephesians 1.5, in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 19, that we have been adopted into the family of God. We see that we have the forgiveness of our sins, and that's in Ephesians 1, chapter 7, or verse 7. We have a future inheritance. That's Ephesians 1, verse 14. We have peace and reconciliation with God. That is Ephesians 2, verse 15 and 16. We have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. That's Ephesians 1, verse 13, verse 2, or chapter 2, verse 22, and it's also in chapter 4. The very Spirit of God who indwells us and who empowers us to live godly lives. That is everything so far in Ephesians, in a nutshell, that God has extended to us in and through Jesus Christ. And there's literally nothing that we have to do, nothing that we can do to earn that. We simply receive it in faith, by trusting in Jesus. Ephesians 2, verses 8 and 9 says, For by grace you have been saved through faith. And it is not of yourselves. This is a gift of God. 
Our salvation is a gift. The gospel is a gift. And that then leads me to my next question. Well, biblically speaking, what is the church? Usually, when the Bible refers to the church or explains the church, it's talking about local gatherings of believers, local assemblies of believers who are gathered together for the name of Jesus Christ whether it be in worship or prayer or service or fellowship or the teaching of Scripture, that's typically what the church is in the New Testament. It's not some building. The Bible never talks about churches as being a building that you go to on Sunday mornings. It's the gathering of people. And that's what LFF is. What is the church at LFF? It is those who believe in Jesus Christ in this local church gathering. So with all that being said, now I turn back to the question, what does it mean for LFF to be a healthier church? How do we move in a biblical, God-honoring direction as a church? What's the answer? Is it more programs? Do we attract more people? Well, I would say the answer, based on what I'm studying here in Ephesians 4, Chapter 4 is is very simple. This is what we need to do to have a healthier church. We just need to lovingly serve one another. That's really all it boils down to. We just need to serve one another in love. All right, shall we pray? I'm just kidding. I'm kidding. Let me flesh out what this means just a little bit more. We need to lovingly serve one another. If you're a leader of any type in the church... Right? If you're in any leadership or teaching or pastoral positions like myself, then it's specified here in Ephesians that the way you love the church, the way you lovingly serve the church is by equipping the rest of the church. In other words, my biblical job, so long as you graciously call me a pastor, is to equip the church for the work of ministry. Uh, if you would, start with me in Ephesians 4.11, and I'll show you what I'm getting at. Paul says, the author of Ephesians, he says, Christ gave uh, the apostles and the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, and the teachers. What is he getting at here? Paul has already talked about apostles and prophets twice in the book of Ephesians. He mentioned them in Ephesians 2, verse 20. And in that passage, he referred to the apostles and prophets as being uh, those who laid the foundation of the church. And then he mentions them again in chapter 3, verse 5. And so what he's probably getting at here in chapter 4, by explaining or by writing about the apostles and prophets, is he's thinking of those early Christians who saw Jesus Christ, who witnessed his death, his burial, and his resurrection, and were commissioned by Christ to establish the New Testament church. They planted churches, and they laid down the doctrines of the faith. In that sense of an apostle and a prophet, there would be no more today, because those were the early Christians who laid the foundation of the church. However, they still have a major impact on us today, because we have their teachings here in the New Testament. They wrote out the New Testament by which we consider authoritative over our life. Furthermore, though, Paul says in verse 11 that Christ not only gave the apostles and prophets, but he gave the evangelists, the shepherds, and the teachers. He seems to be referring to people who teach the doctrines of the faith. In other words, what I think he's getting at is that Christ has given to the church not only the apostles and the prophets who laid the foundation of the faith, but he, throughout history has given teachers and leaders to equip the church following in the manner of the apostles and the prophets. In other words, church leaders should, in theory, pastors, teachers, evangelists, elders, should continue on in the teaching of the apostles. In other words, my focus should just be on preaching and teaching the contents of the Christian faith as laid out in Scripture. So what is the purpose, then, of these five different 
leaders. And we see that in verse 12. The purpose is to equip the saints for the work of ministry. Now that word there in verse 12, equip, uh, it comes from the Greek word, which means, or it, it says, katartismo. It's kind of an interesting word, but the literal meaning of this Greek word is to, to set a bone in place. It is a medical term. It is often used sometimes, too, of mending fishing nets. But when you think about this word, I think it does give us kind of a cool picture of what the job is of church leaders, or what are they called to do biblically, to set bones in place. Well, what does that mean figuratively? Right? You see, if you have a dislocated joint or a dislocated bone, you know that there's no way you can function at 100% capacity. Like, last year, I think I either jammed or broke my finger on the basketball court. My pinky finger of all fingers, and you can still tell even here today, it's more swollen than my right pinky, but it drove me nuts for the longest time. See, if you have something that's out of place, you just can't function at 100%. What's the role of pastors, of evangelists, of teachers? It's to locate the saints within the body of Christ, to help everybody in the church function at 100% in whatever God has for them. Now, how do we do that? It seems like Paul's getting at two ways that leaders need to equip the saints. How do I serve you? I serve you by equipping you. How do I equip you? First of all, I need to make every effort to preach and teach the contents of the Christian faith, as I've already explained. But we see why in verses 14. If we don't have a firm foundation of our faith, if we don't really know what we believe, this is what happens. Uh, we become like children who are tossed to and fro by the waves and we're, we're carried about by every wind of doctrine by human cunning, by craftiness and deceitful schemes. In other words, if we don't have a firm foundation in what we believe, if we don't know what we believe or why we believe it, Paul says without that knowledge, we're just going to be susceptible to every kind of teaching this world offers. Whether it's false teaching, whether it's cults or heretical preachers, which God help me to not be, or whether it's philosophies that are contrary to the gospel, if we're not rooted and grounded in the faith, we are going to be completely susceptible to these things. And so my job is to do everything I can to preach and teach this Christian faith so that, by God's grace, we all have a, a, a foundation for what we believe. We have stability in our life and in our faith. And then the second thing I need to do to equip people is really just to unleash the church, to empower everybody to use their God-given gifts to serve for the work of ministry, to equip the saints for the work of ministry. That is my goal, and really, if you teach or you lead in any capacity, whether you're an elder or a Sunday school teacher, or you teach kids on Wednesday nights, or maybe you're part of a Bible study that you lead, or you're meeting with somebody one-on-one, -on -one, if you're in any teaching position or pastoral position, our goal should always be the same, to explain to people the doctrines of the faith and to help them live it out, to apply it to their life so that they can do ministry in and for Jesus Christ. So, how do we become a healthier church? Well, it starts with the leaders serving the church lovingly by doing everything we can to equip the church. But everybody has a role to play. I mean, did you notice that in verse 12, that what is probably a shocking uh, news to some people, it's actually not the pastors who do the ministry. Like, man, how many churches today do you actually see this lived out? To think the church is where you go for some kind of feeding, but it's those who are paid and those who are leaders that do all the ministry. But Paul's saying here, no, 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 no. This isn't how it works. 
the pastors are the ones who equip the rest of the church for the work of the ministry. The implication is that everybody who is part of the church has a role to play. If you are a part of the church, that means you also have a part in the church. We lovingly serve one another in various ways. So what does this look like? What does it look like for you? What does it look like for me? Uh, Again, trying to explain it based on Ephesians. uh, If you go back a few verses to verse 7, I just kind of want to review this verse again, even though we talked about it last week, and it's probably old news, but look at what Paul says in verse 7. He's talking about unity and uh, maintaining unity, but then in verse 7 he says, uh, but grace was given to each one of us according to the measure of Christ's gift. He's not talking about saving grace there. What Paul's referring to is spiritual gifts. God-given ability or power or spiritual gifts for the sake of serving other people. In other words, God has gifted each one of us in a unique way so that we can use that gift to build the church up, to build one another up. What are those gifts? There's a whole variety of gifts listed. Uh, We see it in Romans 12, and we see it in 1 Corinthians 12. We see it in 1 Peter 4. None of the spiritual gifts, gifts, those lists are exhaustive, but there's a lot of different gifts mentioned. For example, maybe you have the gift of uh, teaching, or maybe you have the gift of evangelism, or maybe you have the gift of leadership or discernment, or maybe you have the gift of generosity, or maybe you have the gift of hospitality, or maybe you have the gift of mercy, or or prophecy, or maybe you have the gift of like a modern-day apostle, somebody who goes and plants churches in uh, unreached parts of the world. I don't know what your God-given gift is, The point I'm trying to make, though, is that you do have a God-given gift as a believer in Jesus Christ, and God didn't give you that gift to waste it. He gave you that gift to serve the church. And this is what happens when we use that gift. When we use the gifts God has given us to the measure of the grace of Christ, or the gift of Christ, we build up the church. This is how God builds up the church. We see this in verse 16 of chapter 4. Start in verse 15. It says, Rather, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ. This is, we practice the truth, speak the truth, we live out the truth, and in this way we grow up into Christ. You move on to verse 16. It says, From whom the whole body, he's talking about the church here, joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped, when each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. It's kind of a tongue twister, confusing verse, but essentially this is what he's saying. When we use our God-given gifts to the measure of Christ, or when we use them properly as Christ would have us, The church is built up. The church becomes healthier. We're built up in the faith. Now, kind of a tangent here, but I feel like almost everybody asks this question. I've wrestled with myself. What are your spiritual gifts? How has God gifted you? Right? That's kind of the million-dollar question, I feel like, for so many of us. How has God gifted me? I need to know that before I can use it, right? There's lots of opinions out there on how to understand what your spiritual gift is. For example, sometimes there's tests given, right? You can go take your spiritual gifts test online. Uh, Some people believe that your spiritual gift is just anything you like doing and that God would bless that work if it's your gift. For example, if you like teaching and people learn from you, then that's probably your spiritual gift. Uh, Some people say that your spiritual gift is identified by the church. So in other words, other people should recognize your God-given gifts. Hey, whatever, I'm cool with those theories, but I actually like John Piper's take on this the best. He's one of my favorite pastors here in America. 
Here is a wild paraphrase of what John Piper says. In other words, it's really not the most important thing for us to figure out what our spiritual gift is. It's really not that important to figure out how God has gifted you. The more important thing than figuring out your spiritual gifts is just figuring out how you can strengthen people. Figuring out how you can serve people. Go with me outside of Ephesians once, and I'll show you what he's getting at. If you would turn with me to Romans 1, verse 11. Romans 1, verse 11. Paul, once again, writing to the church in Rome. In verse 11, Paul says this. He says, For I long to see you, that I may give to you some spiritual gift to strengthen you. That I may give you some spiritual gift to strengthen you. That is, that we may be mutually encouraged by each other's faith, both yours and mine. What is Paul's main goal in Romans verse uh, 11 here? It's to strengthen the faith of fellow believers. That is his aim. I really think if we just have the willingness to serve people, if we are looking for ways to strengthen the faith of those around us, our fellow believers here in this church, if we're praying that God would show us ways that we can strengthen others, he's going to show us ways. He's going to show us ways to serve one another. And the whole thing about spiritual gifts, it's just going to happen. You're just going to serve in a way that you want to, but also in a way that God has enabled you. So, again, just to rephrase that, don't worry so much about what your spiritual gift is. Just focus on trying to serve people, on trying to build people up, to strengthen their faith in the midst of storms. So then, again, to recap, this is how we become a healthier church, by everybody taking initiative, playing their part, and looking for ways to lovingly serve one another and I keep saying lovingly because Paul uses the word love all over Ephesians, especially in chapter 4. Um, he says in verse 2 that we need to bear with one, one another in love. Uh, he says in verse 15 that we are to speak the truth and to live out the truth in love. And then in verse 16 at the very end, when the body grows up, it builds itself up in love. Love. So in other words, everything we do, every time we look to serve people, it should always be in an attitude of love, in the same way that Christ loved us. So that's how we build a healthier church. And then the question is, well, what are the characteristics of a healthier church? What should the goal of the church be? And once again, I would just turn, if you would, uh, just to verse 13. All of this, all, all of this service in here is for the goals mentioned in verse 13. Essentially what Paul says is the goal is for the church itself to be unified around the gospel. This is a characteristic of a healthy church, one that is unified around the gospel of Christ. It says until we all attain the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God. And then he explains it in one more way. It's maturity. To mature manhood to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. In other words, what are the characteristics of a healthy church? Unity and maturity. That the church as a whole and every individual in it should be striving to look and resemble Christ more and more in their everyday life. This is our ultimate goal, is to be like Jesus in our existence to grow up in Christ, to reach the measure of the standard of Christ. If we get more people in church, great, right? 
If we get more programs, great. Cool beans. But those aren't our ultimate goals. Our ultimate goals are to just be more like Christ and to be unified around the gospel. So to recap, um, here's how we become a healthier church. To lovingly serve one another in the God-given ways so that we can all become more like Christ. Let me just end uh, with just kind of a concluding thought. Don't underestimate the difference it can make to lovingly serve somebody. Don't underestimate the difference that you can make in somebody's life by lovingly serving them. I I want to tell you this story for a two-part reason. Most of you already know, right, that Maddie and I have been expecting uh, child number two, right? And uh, we we had our first ultrasound on Monday. And uh, we were so excited because it was the first time uh, we got to see, uh, you know, our child. And so we go in for our ultrasound, and uh, we finally see the baby. It seemed like something was wrong right away, and the doctor was kind of hesitating. And finally she looked at Maddie, and she's just like, yeah, it doesn't have a heartbeat. And uh, it was just like some of the most devastating, gut-wrenching, blindsided news uh, we've ever heard. You know, we went in there with such excitement only to find out she's carrying a dead child. It was just awful. Like, I can't think of worse news than that. And it kind of wrecked our week. I mean, rightfully so, right? I prayed a lot this week that the Lord would strengthen us, that he'd be with us, that he would encourage us, that he'd go before us. That was my prayer, and then I have to ask, well, did God answer it? You know, Tuesday morning at like 6 a.m., I got up, and I'm, I'm reading Isaiah 26. I haven't been in Isaiah for like over a year. And 26 verse 3, it says, You will keep in perfect peace the one whose mind is focused on you because he trusts in you. I thought, man, this is such a fitting verse for us this week. But then it was kind of funny, not even two hours later, a pastor from a different church in town sends me a devotional text. It was literally the most random text ever, but his devotional thought was on Isaiah 26, verse 3. The Lord will keep in perfect peace whose mind is focused on him and how we need to focus and trust in the Lord. And, you know, as the week went on, it's just like, Different people reached out to us in different ways. And it was just like super encouraging. A couple people brought meals over and just sat there and just visited with us for a bit. And uh, that meant a lot to us. And some people sent text messages to us. And that meant so much to us. It's just a small thing. Other people prayed for us. They prayed with us. Uh, My in-laws took Judah for just a day just to give Maddie and I a break. It was really helpful. I really didn't want to study for the sermon this week, but fortunately, by the grace of God, a couple others helped me out with the sermon. They studied with me and gave me thoughts about this text. Uh, What's the point I'm making here? Well, I I bring all this up in one sense because I just, I want you to know, since most knew that we were pregnant, and I don't want you asking Maddie about her pregnancy, but I also say it for this reason. I was praying that God would help us, that he would strengthen us. And the question is, well, did he? And I would say, absolutely, yes. But here's how. He did it through random people who had really nothing in common, right? The person bringing the meal didn't really have anything in common with the person praying who had anything in common with the person who took Judah. That person didn't really have anything in common with the person who, you name it, sent me the devotion, except something, right? And here's what they all had in common. Just a willingness to lovingly serve Maddie and I in the way that Christ would serve us. And so because of that, and in and through that, I felt like we had really one of the most uh, vivid extensions of God's grace and kindness in our life. But it wasn't just this direct thing, but it was God working through various people 
In fact, I asked Maddie on Friday night, we're sitting out on a deck, I'm like, well, what's been encouraging to you this week? And that's what she said. It was all the people who reached out to us. This is why I say, don't underestimate the impact that you can have on somebody's life just by being willing to reach out in love to see how you can strengthen their faith or build them up. Sometimes you can tell people about Jesus, and that's impactful. But sometimes it's even more impactful to show people Jesus with your hands and your feet. It is powerful. And if we would just do this as a church on a regular basis, which most of you already do so much better than I ever will, I can't imagine how much healthier we will continue to become. So, again, I just say that because let's lovingly serve people for the building up of Christ. That being said, let me uh, close this with a word of prayer. Uh, Dear Lord, I just pray that um, you would allow us to all take part in the ministry that you have uh, led us to. And I just pray, Jesus, that uh, nobody would sit on the sidelines, Father, that we would all dig our feet in and serve people in the way that you have served, in the way that you have loved us. Uh, You're so kind and you're so merciful. Thank you for using other believers in our life to remind us of uh, your love and your grace and your truth. It's all in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen.